We can develop the economies of our country to provide a more dignified standard of living for the mass of our people. That's our main concern, how to, how to develop our economies. We are we're sitting on all the resources in the world, and yet we are, the amongst, we are the poorest people on the globe. So how to, as it were, remove that disconnect? That really is a function of leadership in Africa at the moment. That matters is true for Africa is as it is true for my country. I'll give you a simple example. Cote d'Ivoire and ourselves, between us, we produce 60% of the world's output of cocoa. 2015, the returns to us, 2 billion to Ghana, 3.75 billion to Cote d'Ivoire. 5.75 billion amongst us. The global cho chocolate market is of 100 billion plus. So you're looking at a situation whereby the farmers who produce get something like five to five and a half percent of the global value chain of their, of their product. Something's not right there. We need to do something about it. What, what can you do? Do you need to renegotiate with the, with the big suppliers, with the makers I of chocolate? That, I think that we have to perhaps make the chocolate ourselves. Uh, we have to find a way of being able to connect the, the raw material to the finished product. Because that is where the value is. And so far, we've been either out of negligence on our part or the difficulties of mobilizing the finance and the technology. We've not been able to do it. I think that this generation of African leaders, these are the issues that we have to look at. We have a globalized trading system that frowns on protectionism, and quite rightly, I think that all of us are in agreement that, as a, as a general principle, free trade benefits everybody in it. But you enter the trading system at different levels of it. And how to make sure that we are competitive, that our enterprises, A, can produce the, the higher value products that the world economy requires, and does so on a competitive basis. These are the challenges before us in, in, on the continent and in my country today, and they are the challenges that are exercising my mind the most. Um, President, I know you want to increase output for cocoa in Ghana. Are you concerned the impact that would have on prices? Because at the si same time, yeah, you're trying to take care to, of your farmers. We want, we want to improve output, largely because it's been declining. But at the same time, we are thinking that we must have a much more collaborative arrangement with Cote d'Ivoire as to our marketing policy, as to how we can develop, in fact, domestic use of these of the things that we do. I believe that we need a much greater consultation between us and them. I mean, if we are responsible for 60% of the world's output of cocoa, we should have much greater leverage on pricing and, than, than we have at the moment. So we're in active discussions. Fortunately for me, at this period in Ghanaian history, when I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm the leader of Ghana, we have a man on the other side in Cote d'Ivoire who's equally sensitive to these issues. So we began to talk in a great deal like, to find a way. President, are you telling me that you would come together with Cote d'Ivoire to try and kind of have a united front in talking about cocoa prices? I think it's a very good idea. I think it's a very good idea. And, and, and broadly, they want to? Cote d'Ivoire wants I, to? I'm, the impression, the clear impression that I have from their president is that they do. And at the moment, in fact, uh, uh, both our governments, our cocoa officials, Agriculture ministers are, in fact, in, 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 in regular contact talking about how best we can develop this common front and common attitude. I think it makes sense. Could, could it also be in, in decreasing output, actually, of cocoa prices? Well, so these, are, these are all the matters that I think that if we sit around the table together and we look at, we will be able then to take the more uh, uh, intelligent decisions for both of us in the long run. Well, the, the, the worst aspect of all these things is to be atomistic. I think that you, if you look at your own national uh, narrow sectional interests, uh, you can lose the bigger picture. And it is that bigger picture that we want to have before us all the time.
so that we can make the decisions that will benefit our farmers and benefit our economy. President, when do you think you'll have a decision on this buy, on cocoa? I don't know. We're talking. Okay. We're uh, talking. Talk to me about the dispute with the Ivory Coast on the ocean and, and the oil fields. Um, the, the decision ruling, is Saturday? The, the decision is on Saturday. We're waiting um, to see what decision will be made. And we'll see how best we can enforce the ruling of the court. Let's say you lose. How can you um, lower the impact? Because this would have huge economic consequences for Ghana. Yes, it would. It would. Um, but I mean, a lot of a lot of work is going on in that way. I would prefer to to wait and see what happens on Saturday before I tell the world what, how we're going to respond. President, thank you for your time. Mr. President, uh, there is a debate raging across Europe over immigration, especially immigration from Africa. We've seen populist parties on the rise, calls for essentially sending back Africans, keeping them on African soil. What is your take on this debate? Well, my concern cannot be with the issue about what's happening in Europe. My concern is about our, 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 our own continent. Uh, and unfortunately, so far, we've had economies that are not generating enough jobs for our young people. So that is our main concern. That is what is fueling the exodus of young people from Africa to Europe and other places in the world. There's nothing peculiar about this. I mean, we've seen this <laughs> all through history. You're saying it's Africa's responsibility of primarily? Of course. Because uh, that's not what everyone says in Africa. But it's our responsibility to create conditions that would allow our young people to be able to live lives of dignity and fulfillment in their places of origin. That's what, that's, that's what the leadership is to be focused upon. That's how our policies should be focused upon. And I, for me, it's, it's obvious that we have a responsibility to our young people. And that responsibility is to create the conditions that will make sure that they see opportunity in their own countries of birth and origin, and therefore avenues are there for them to be able to live lives of fulfillment in their own countries. I don't think that you, anybody will cross the Sahara and go into these rickety boats in the Mediterranean because they, they want to. They feel a certain compulsion to do so because at home, the opportunities that they're looking for are not there. So that has to be our main concern. I'm not concerned about the European angle. I'm concerned about the African angle and what we need to do in Africa to make sure that we create economies that generate jobs for our people. But some in Africa, including some African leaders, are blaming colonialism, are saying we need more aid. From what I understand, that's absolutely not what you're thinking. Definitely not. Um, colonialism obviously had a very important historical impact on our societies and our nations and largely of a distortive nature. It was, it, 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 it did many things that were clearly not in our interests, resources that were taken out, the, the distortion of our, of our societies. But, but that's the reality we inherited at independence. So since then, we have had within ourselves the opportunity to address whatever inequalities, imbalances, distortions that were created by imperialism and colonialism. And that hasn't happened. And that, that has not happened successfully so far. Why, why is that? I mean, according to the World Bank, we, there are many statistics around. There's just a recent report saying sub-Saharan Africa is the only region where extreme poverty is expected to increase. Why is that? Because the economies that we are operating at the moment are not working as a, a significant... Is it just the economy, Mr. President, or is it, is it governance economy, or corruption? Let's, well, let's... Well, the economies, and they are impacted by the, 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 uh, the manner in which the economies function. Uh, several things impact on it. Some of it is governance. Some of it, governance in the sense of institutions that are not effective in delivering, institutions that, are, that don't, don't serve their purpose. Corruption is a way of also uh, distorting and destabilizing the manner in which institutions work. But ultimately, when you have appropriate policy, 
appropriate policy will take into account all of these phenomena, institutional relevance, the, the quality of public services, the clarity of economic policy and its implementation. All of those are in the box of what I call policy. And that is the big challenge for us, to devise the, the, the policies that will see for the rapid growth of our economies. We're looking at the economies that should be growing at 10, 11, 12 percent persistently for, say, a decade. And that will, that will allow us to have the transformation of our economies that we need. And I have no doubt that if at the end of that period we succeed in, and I believe that there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, um, ingredients in place that should allow us to succeed. If we do, the issue of migration to Europe is going to be, uh, come uh, very much a secondary uh, a matter of, of, of a distant memory. Uh, you, you talked about institutions. Obviously, in Ghana, you have competitive elections. Uh, but we've seen, I should say, maybe a trend of uh, leaders uh, trying to change, twist the constitution to be able to run again and again and again. Is this a danger for democracy in Africa? They say, of course, that this is for the sake of stability, visibility, and so on. On these are matters where, at, at, at any one stage, you have to look at the individual histories of, of the separate nations. Is there's Africa, but at the same time, it's, it's made up of 54 different countries. But would because you be in favor of a limitation of presidential in, mandates? In Ghana, we have that. And you don't want to change that? And we are not, there's no, there's no desire, there's no, there's no movement for it in Ghana. I myself would not support any such change. I think that the mandate, the term of the mandate, when you look at our history, is very, very relevant. And so far, it has served as well. We have, as we speak, three ex-presidents in Ghana who are living. For, uh, president J Jerry John Rawlins, President John Ajikun Kufu, and the last President John Dramani Mahama. Each one of them have served their, their, their terms. And one of them been... would maybe like to run again. Yes, no, not maybe. I think he's made it public that he right. wants to run again. So, but that's not a matter of, of any great concern. He's a, an important citizen in our country. He wants to exercise his civic rights. He's entitled to do so. I want to get to uh, one of the issues that's maybe giving you some headaches or nightmares, I don't know, the issue of terrorism. Uh, because obviously there was terrorism focused in Mali, Niger, now Burkina Faso, your neighbor, the east of Burkina Faso has become regularly a target for terrorist groups. Are you concerned by this development and that this could indeed cross the border into your country? Have you foiled plots? Are you seeing this? We have to be concerned. I mean, the, the old statement that uh, when your neighbor's house on fire, you have to try and help them douse it before it comes into your own home is as true today as it has ever been. The, the jihadist insurrection through the Sahelian part of, of, of West Africa is a matter of very grave concern. Um, I applaud the members of the G5 the countries of Chad and Mauritania and Mali, Burkina Faso and uh, Niger, who are, as it were, in the forefront, the front line of the struggle, because it's, uh, it's basically a fight for all of us. Uh, we're seeing it in Boko Haram in Nigeria. Uh, it's, it's, it's a matter of very, very great concern. Have there been attempts? So far, so far. In Ghana? Touch wood. No, in Ghana. So but it far, could happen. Of course. If it's happening in Burkina Faso, there were incidents in Côte d'Ivoire. It can also happen in Ghana. But we are, are, are attempting to tackle the problem you know, in, in, in a multifaceted manner. First of all, um, trying to improve the economy so that uh, we can get more and more young people engaged. I say the devil finds work for idle hands. The less idle the hands, the more likely that they'll be making productive uh, contributions to the growth of the country. We are also 
tackling the matters from a, a cultural angle. Uh, Ghana has a very strong, positive record of religious tolerance and openness, and also for interreligious uh, harmony and cooperation. Muslims and Christians live together in Ghana in a very good way. Uh, something which is quite Ghanaian is at all our national events, you usually have a Christian prayer and a Muslim prayer, but it is to create this atmosphere of oneness in the country, and it, so far it is helping us. Uh, but we, uh, these are areas where you cannot predict, you can take precautions, uh, keeping uh, security services and an intelligence system very alive to the challenge, recognizing that at any one stage, some events, outrages of the sort that we've seen in Burkina Faso in recent years can happen in your own country, so you are on the lookout. But basically, you are also trying to make sure that your response is not just a military one, but that it is a response that also tries to deal with how young people especially will react. Just very quickly, we're running out of time. Uh, the first U.S. lady, Melania Trump, is uh, going uh, to Ghana. It's her first solo trip. Uh, it seems uh, that uh, it's going to be an honor for your country. How, yeah. how do you take it? Not oh. all African countries have good relations with the we Trump have, administration. We have good relations with the United States of America. We've had good relations with the United States of America for a long time. Several different administrations have come and gone. Uh, in, in, in recent times in Ghana, uh, the, uh, we've had two Democratic presidents, one Republican president visiting Ghana. George Bush visited Ghana, just as his predecessor, Bill Clinton, who visited Ghana, just as President Bush's successor. Uh, President Obama visited Ghana. So we, we have good relations with the United States of America, and we want to continue to have these good relations with the United States of America. And we see the visit of uh, the American First Lady to, to Ghana as, a, as, a, as an incident, a, a manifestation of the good relations we have in America. So we're, we're, we're very happy to see, and we're, work, we're waiting uh, eagerly to welcome her. And maybe her husband in the near future. Well, you never know. Why not? And we should not have to give unusual tax and royalty incentives. And mining companies should not expect to make extraordinary profits on our continent. We are realistic enough to know that companies that come to do business must make their profit. But we want to work with them under the normal conditions that pertain in other parts of the world. It bears repeating here what I have said elsewhere. Africa needs her own set of smart, tough lawyers, accountants, and engineers to negotiate the business deal in a transparent and honest manner. We must strike deals that are fair to both sides and can reassure the long-suffering African people that they are no longer being unfairly treated. Reviewing mining contracts is important for more than earning greater revenue. Governments must also respond to pressures from civil society groups and communities to ensure that contracts and mining codes address environmental protection, adequate compensation to affected communities, and the rehabilitation of land after mining operations have ceased. Minerals are a public resource, and the negotiations between companies and countries should be transparent, accessible, and easily understandable by citizens. And that means we should do it all in language that does not need to be interpreted by experts. Communities should be able to examine mining contracts, finding out how much revenue has been generated and how and on what it is being spent. Long and bitter experience means both sides, African governments and mining companies, have to work hard to gain the trust of the people. One cannot, ladies and gentlemen, discount the illuminating report produced by a high-level panel chaired by the highly respected former president of this country, 
his Excellency Thabo Mbeki, which says that Africa is losing annually more than 50 billion United States dollars through illicit financial outflows. The report of the high-level panel on illicit financial flows from Africa, commissioned by the Joint African Union Commission and the and United Nations Economic Commission for Africa Conference of African Ministers for Finance, Planning and Economic Development, revealed in particular that between 2000 and 2008, 252 billion United States dollars, representing 56.2% of the illicit outflow of funds from the continent, was from the extractive industries, including mining. <coughs> Please excuse me. And yet we know that the extractive sector, particularly mining, can help rapidly to grow Africa's manufacturing sector and be the champion of economic growth on the continent. That, of course, will not happen if Africa remains the place to come and dig minerals that are exported in their raw condition to be processed outside. We cannot and should not continue to be merely exporters of raw materials to other countries. The value chain of mineral extraction has great potential for job creation and can form an essential basis for the transformation of economies around the continent. We recognize the transparency and regulation of invested capital in junior mining companies underpin investment appeal. Over the years, our mining sector has been financed by capital markets on foreign exchanges. They have leveraged access to early stage investments to create significant wealth for investors offshore. The fact of the matter is that local capital within most mining jurisdictions in Africa face geopolitical constraints in the funding of early stage opportunities in their own countries. Canada, Australia, the Americas, and South Africa have spectacular examples of considerable wealth created amongst individuals and corporations as a result of significant discoveries in faraway lands that are financed by early seed capital raised on their local exchanges. Ghana, undoubtedly, is amongst the most matured and stable mining jurisdictions in Africa. And for the first time, my government is putting together a regulatory framework and fiscal incentives to enable local companies list early stage promising prospects on our local stock exchange, thereby taking full advantage of these incentives. <laughs> this will allow local capital the benefits of the upside in project development, enable it to contribute effectively to the process of rapid economic development and transformation. We are now all more sensitive to the needs of the environment and the dangers posed by the degradation caused by reckless mining practices. We in Ghana have a big problem with the particularly dark side of mining, which has been leading to an alarming degradation of our lands and water bodies. We have a name for it in Ghana, Galamse, i.e. illegal mining. Time was when this was a relatively minor practice of individuals digging for gold in their communities. You could describe it almost as romantic as young people try their hands at it before moving on to their main professions. Now, it has become a large scale and dangerous operation that has reduced our lands and water bodies to sad spectacles, mainly as a result of the introduction of sophisticated equipment and machinery into the field by foreign controls criminal syndicates. In Ghana, we moved to address this issue by initially placing a two-year ban on small-scale mining upon my assumption of office in January 2017 in order to fashion and implement policies on how to sanitize the sector and ensure that in future, small-scale mining would not damage our environment. 
We have to train some of the small-scale miners in responsible mining and find alternative livelihood resources for others who are engaged in illegal mining. Our efforts have begun to yield dividends. Some of the heavily polluted rivers are showing signs of being restored to health. And recently, there was a lot of excitement. Fish were seen again in one of the most famous rivers of our country, the Ancobra River, after many years of turbidity. We are determined to strengthen the regulatory framework for mining so that illegal mining, i.e. Ganamse, does not reappear. I know that we are not the only ones experiencing this phenomenon, and there are other countries on the continent where illegal mining activities are threatening to overwhelm local authorities. The extreme case is probably the Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC, where its many minerals are such magnets for adventurers from around the world that they instigate the instability in the country. Ladies and gentlemen, earlier on, I made reference to the state of mining communities in our country. I believe it is a point that cannot and should not be simply mentioned in passing. Take, for example, the town of Obwasi in Ghana, the home of Anglo Gold Ashanti, where there's been official mining for more than a century. In times past, it was said to be the richest gold mine in the world, and it has certainly made some people in the United Kingdom and the United States, and probably in South Africa too, very rich. So why does Obwasi not look like the place from where hundreds of millions of dollars have been made? It should be the most beautiful city in Ghana or the world if it hosts the richest gold mine, but it is far from it. After an absence of five years from the scene, because of the uncontrolled activities of illegal miners on its concession, the company is back again. I had the pleasure of reopening the mine two weeks ago on the 22nd of January under an agreement that balances more fairly the interests of the two sides, that is the government of Ghana and Anglo Gold Ashanti. As I said at the ceremony, it is my hope and expectation that this time round, under the new management of Anglo Gold Ashanti, the development of Obwase will reflect the wealth its soil produces. Why is the Kona region of Sierra Leone, where a local pastor digging around his garden can still find a 709 carat gem diamond, not developed and prosperous? Why do towns from whose soils diamonds have been taken all these years not look like anything they produce riches? Why are the mining com com communities generally in such poor conditions? The, st the stressed state of communities in which mining companies operate is nothing short of a disgrace, and we must work to change that situation. Even though a few mining companies have over the years complemented the work of, Ghana, of government in these communities, I'm certain that a lot more can be done to transform the communities if government and the mining companies collaborate in an intelligent and sustainable manner. Ladies and gentlemen, the mining industry has what it takes to help them make the economic transformation we seek in Africa. Go to any mine, and it is obvious you are innovators, you are persistent, and you have expertise. How else do you find the minerals you see from the bowels of the earth? You are hard workers, and it shows in what you do. In addition to the exploitation of the traditional minerals of gold, diamond, and manganese in Ghana, we have also taken the decision at long last to exploit our considerable bauxite and iron ore deposits. We've established the Ghana Integrated Aluminum Development Corporation, a public corporation, to take charge of the development with appropriate investors of the full chain, the full value chain of our bauxite resources in order to establish an integrated aluminum industry in Ghana. 
We're also determined to build an integrated iron and steel industry out of our extensive iron, ore, and manganese deposits to serve the needs of our country and region. And to that end, Parliament in this current session will consider and hopefully approve the establishment of another public corporation, the Ghana Integrated Iron and Steel Development Corporation, which will, with appropriate investors, take charge of this undertaking. Another modern mineral, lithium, which is being used in several applications, is present in commercial quantities in Ghana. Work is currently underway, again with the appropriate investment to exploit it for the economic development of our country. We hope to establish in all these new ventures an equitable balance between our needs and the needs of the investor community. It is time for the mineral sector to produce win-win situations for all sta stakeholders. I do not need to tell you that there are undiscovered riches inside the bowels of the lands in Africa, but I want to remind you that there are riches on the, tops, on the top of the lands also in the form of a young, vibrant, and dynamic population who are anxious to work, and who, with the requisite skills, represent an extremely positive factor in the rapid development of the continent. We want you to stay here for the long term, respect the land that provides the riches, and be part of the transformation. Africa has made the world rich with our minerals, our gemstones adorn, adorn crowns and homes around the world. It is time to make Africa prosperous and enable her people to attain a dignified standard of living. Join us in this exciting project for sustainable economic growth. The people of Africa do not have to be poor for others to be rich. The state of modern technology has made it possible, probably for the first time in human history, to establish a global economy which can generate shared and mutually reinforcing prosperity for all the peoples of the world. The world can then look forward to the emergence of a new world civilization, which, shorn of greed and cupidity, has boundless prospects for human advancement, where the overwhelming majority of mankind can live in dignity and security and give birth to a new, extraordinary golden age where the arts, culture, philosophy, science, and technology can flourish in an unprecedented scale. I thank you very much for your attention. Protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome to the United Nations His Excellency Nana Adu Dankwa Akufu Adu, President of the Republic of Ghana, and to invite him to address the Assembly. Mr. President, Secretary General, Your Excellencies, Ghana presents her compliments to you, Mr. President, worthy representative of our great neighbor, the Federal Republic of Nigeria, and extends hearty congratulations on your election to preside over this 74th General Assembly. We extend our appreciation to the President of the 73rd Session for her work and commend the brave theme that has been selected for our consideration during this meeting. I note that there is a United Nations accepted definition of poverty, which like everything undertaken by our institution, tries to find a form of words that is acceptable to all of us. But Mr. President, it is probably right to say that those of us who live in countries generally referred to as developing countries, get somewhat bemused by arguments and complicated definitions of poverty. For us, 
Poverty is a daily reality that we live with and feel. For far too many of our people are burdened with it. And it robs us of the dignity that should be the inherent right of every human being. We know that our performance as governments will be judged by how successful we are in reducing and eventually eradicating poverty in our countries. The responsibility is ours as individual sovereign countries, knowledge not only to aim at reducing poverty, but actually to create prosperity for all our citizens. We in Ghana certainly are engaged in fighting to eradicate poverty from our country. If the world wants to marshal all its undoubted energies to support this fight, there cannot be a better start than an acknowledgement and a consensus among the nations of the world that indeed poverty anywhere degrades us all, whether in the developed or developing world. Luckily for us, technological advances are short-circuiting the path that leads us out of poverty and it is no longer the long and tortuous road it used to be. A mere 20 years ago, mobile phones were a rarity that some fear would become a developed world status symbol and another sign of the technology gap between the rich and the poor. Today, the poorest person in the most inaccessible place in the poorest country has a mobile phone, often a smartphone. In many ways, it has transformed our lives. In the year 2000 in Ghana, there were 90,000 mobile phone subscribers. Today, there are more than 41 million subscriptions. This has led to a remarkable difference in communications within our country and with the outside world. A sizable and growing number of the population has been and is being brought into the formal banking sector by the mobile phone. Mr. President, the application of technology can be the tool to set us on the road to prosperity. The modernization of agriculture through the application of technology could well turn out to be the fastest way to make the turnaround that we seek. The young people of the world especially the youth of Ghana and Africa, have demonstrated their ingenuity and innovative prowess, and we need to enlist them fully in the fight. It would be an easier battle, of course, if trade practices were seen to be more equitable and fairer. The question always remains whether the rich nations are prepared for an equitable and fair trading order. It appears that they are not, and we have thus to continue to fight for a fairer world economic order. It should not be lost on anyone that the minerals on which the world depends to move industry and manufacturing are mostly available in Africa. And yet we, who own these fundamental resources by birthright, have remained poor, whilst our minerals have brought vast wealth to nations and peoples outside our continent. It is worth pointing out also that not only do we not get a fair share of the wealth once extracted, our lands, our environment, our oceans are often left devastated by the process and the competition to gain control over these minerals has often led to insecurity in our countries. I do not seek to blame outsiders for our problems, but since we are being urged to find multilateral solutions, I believe it is worth pointing out that unfairness in the economic order undermines the fight against poverty. Indeed, the flight of capital is continuing the foreign exploitation of Africa represented by colonialism and imperialism. The report of the panel, chaired by the highly respected former South African president, Thabo Mbeki, on the illicit flow of funds from Africa has raised the lid on what many had always suspected but did not have the figures to support. According to that report, Africa is losing annually more than 50 billion United States dollars through illicit financial outflows. 
collaboration is certainly needed amongst the nations of the world to stop this rape of Africa. The African Continental Free Trade Area, which recently came into effect, and whose Secretariat Ghana has the honor of hosting, is a major collective effort by Africa to get to grips with mastery of her own development. It will be the world's largest free trade area since the formation of the World Trade Organization and will provide the vehicle for us to trade better among ourselves, offer an opportunity to exploit our abundant wealth and resources for the benefit of our peoples and give us protection in how to deal with other trading blocks. Mr. President, the fight to eradicate poverty is instinctively linked to quality education, the second part of the problems identified for special attention during this General Assembly meeting. Wherever quality education is available, there's usually prosperity. Throughout the ages, education has been the most equitable source of providing opportunities and has provided the fastest and most reliable route out of poverty. We in Ghana acknowledge that we need an educated and skilled population to be able to compete effectively in the world economy. We're therefore taking the courageous step of spending on education a substantial part of our national revenue, indeed, a third of our nation's budget. Mr. President, in this area also, we can and should employ technology to accelerate the provision of quality education to as many people as possible. Very soon, we might not have to enter classrooms, nor even go to the hallowed grounds of the famous universities to gain access to the knowledge that used to be exclusively available in those institutions. It is possible now for our young people to listen to lectures and watch experiments by famous scientists and scholars on their smartphones and laptops without setting eyes on or physically ever entering an Ivy League university. But to be able to benefit from these opportunities made possible by technology, we need to raise our infrastructure to a basic minimum level. We need to provide reliable electricity and internet services to the people in our towns and villages, and then they can truly join in the benefits of the technology that bring quality education to all we can then have a realistic expectation of a prosperous future. Mr. President, the General Assembly of the United Nations is usually held at the time of year when the extremes of nature are on display around the world. Maybe we are being urged to take notice and hopefully take practical and proactive steps to curb the human activities that are endangering our planet. Our world is enriched by the diversity of cultures and religions and beliefs. They add spice to our lives. But there are scientific and mathematical truths that do not change with space or time. And these truths we all do well to uphold. Now that the scientists have spoken on the realities of climate change, I believe it is time to direct our energies to what we can and should do to counteract the danger and stop unnecessary arguments. Nature has been brutal this year in demonstrating to us that our climate is changing and we're probably pushing our world to destruction. The devastation wrecked by Cyclone Idai, Hurricane Dorian, the extreme summer temperatures across Europe surely provide the evidence, if some were still needed, that it's time to take action to bring back our world from the precipice. This year is the 50th anniversary of the historic landing on the moon, which was a seminal event that celebrated scientific achievement and humanity's triumph. The image that has stayed with me since I was 25 years old, and which still brings me true awe and wonder, is that picture of the Earth taken from the vantage point the astronauts had, which showed clearly the truth of the one world that we inhabit. We could try to delineate our borders more clearly. We could make clearer distinctions on the basis of color, race, 
language, and creed. That picture tells us the natural path is to be inclusive. This in no way is meant to paper over the many difficulties we have in our part of the world that we have to overcome, or to suggest that because some parts of the world are developed and prosperous, we can pretend all is well with us as well. In my part of the world, we do not argue over what constitutes poverty. We know it, we live with it, feel it, and it is a daily reality. As the old saying goes, birds sing, not because they have answers, but because they have songs. There might not be any one answer to the theme of this 74th General Assembly, but the hope is that the discussions point us to the possibility of a new world in which collaboration between the nations and peoples is on such a scale that one can dream of and achieve a sustainably prosperous world. I thank you. His Excellency Nana Ado Dankwa Akufo Ado, President of the Republic of Ghana, and invite him to address the Assembly. Mr. President, I congratulate you warmly on your assumption of office as President of the General Assembly, the Assembly of Humanity, and wish you well in the management of our affairs. I congratulate also the Secretary General on his unanimous re-election for a second term. The common agenda that he has outlined provides us with a powerful framework within which to tackle effectively global issues in these first decades of the 21st century. The presence here in New York of 102 leaders of nations in this 76th session tells us of our resolve to return the world to normalcy. We're not there yet, but we're making considerable progress. Back in 2017, when I made my first appearance at the General Assembly as the newly elected president of Ghana, I said neither Ghana nor Africa wanted to be scars on anybody's conscience. I said we want to build economies that are not dependent on charity and handouts because long and bitter experiences have taught us that no matter how generous the charity, we would remain poor. Between 2017 to 2020, Ghana recorded an average growth rate of 7% amongst the highest in the world. In 2020, when the global economy in sub-Saharan Africa is contracted by 3.5% and 2.1% respectively, Ghana was one of the few countries that produced a positive growth rate. This is a testament to our determination to build a Ghana beyond aid. One year on, Although infection rates and deaths are relatively lower in the region, the virus's impact on economies and livelihoods has been damaging. The latest numbers from the African Development Bank indicate that African economies, which contracted by 2.1% in 2020, are yet to return to pre-pandemic levels. More than 30 million Africans fell into extreme poverty in 2020 and nearly 40 million could do so in 2021. The social impact has been devastating. Over 103 million African jobs have been lost. Women, who account for 40% of total in employment, have been most hard hit. So, President, we're listening to the scientists. It is evident that vaccination is the way to protect populations and revitalize societies. To vaccinate 70% in the shortest possible time, as is being done elsewhere in the world, means some 900 million Africans have to be vaccinated. The Afro-Exim Bank structuring of the African Africa Vaccine Acquisition Task Force $2 billion acquisition of 400 million Johnson & Johnson vaccines is part of the historic African Union's COVID-19 vaccine de development and access strategy. It is a critical milestone in our collective fight against the pandemic in a continent 
suffering the worst brunt of vaccine nationalism. The Africa Vaccine Acquisition Task Force vaccine program, partly manufactured in South Africa, is the single largest and most far-reaching trade transaction since the entry into force of the African Continental Free Trade Area in January this year. It is eloquent testimony to the benefits of domestic production and pooled procurement in Africa as envisaged by the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. Ghana agrees with the call of the Rome Declaration of Global Health for voluntary licensing and technology transfers to boost vaccine production. The Africa Union is working with WHO, WTO, and other global partners to expand its vaccine manu manufacturing and deployment. We in Ghana have so far received 5 million doses, which have been administered to frontline health workers and those classified as being most at risk. 5 million is not a figure to be sneered at, particularly when we consider the situation in many other African countries. We're grateful that our efforts at the management of the pandemic and vaccine distribution have been recognized and we have received these amounts so far. We're still hoping to vaccinate 20 million of our people by the end of the year. One unfortunate development appears to be the recent measures on entry into some countries in Europe, which suggests that Covishield, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine manufactured in India, is not recognized by these countries. What is intriguing is the fact that this vaccine was donated to African countries through the COVAX facility. The use of vaccines as a tool for immigration control will be a truly retrogressive step. Mr. President, the last time there was such an upheaval in the world was during the Second World War, which led to the establishment of a new world order. This organization, the United Nations, and the other Bretton Woods institutions were created to maintain international peace and security, help rebuild the shattered post-war economy, and promote global economic cooperation. Even before the pandemic outbreak, many had concluded that the current structure of global economic cooperation, designed some 77 years ago, has proven inadequate to finance infrastructure and economic transformation in developing countries. Given the incapacity of the global financial system to produce the necessary outcomes to finance sustainable development, we need a constructive review. COVID-19 provides a great chance to rethink global economic cooperation based on the principles of mutuality, equity, sustainability, and collective prosperity envisaged by the SDGs. There is no question but that if the famous gathering in San Francisco was to take place today, it would be a significantly different United Nations Charter that would be written. In much the same way, a World Bank or IMF or WHO that is born today would be radically different institutions from those that were set up after the World War. As many of the countries in today's world, especially in Africa and the Caribbean, were not present in San Francisco. The pandemic has also shown us that the, that the great advances in science and technology notwithstanding, we still have a lot to learn and discover about the human body and about life. Thus far, in spite of the grisly predictions of dead bodies littering the streets of Africa, and in spite of not having as much access to vaccine as the developed world, Africa seems mercifully to have escaped the worst of the COVID death rates. And for that, we thank God. Ghana wants to share a few thoughts which we believe should form the basis for the new global cooperation. Firstly, we need to strengthen the funding of the existing global health organizations. This must include a greater, more predictable base of multilateral funding for WHO and regional centers of disease controls, which play the central roles 
in global health security. It will require dedicating an additional 1% of GDP to funding global health. This is an investment in the global public aid goal, not aid. Secondly, we must develop more resilient finances to build back better and for future preparedness. Across the African continent, revenues have decreased by as much as 150 billion United States dollars as economists are still reeling from the economic impact of the pandemic. African governments have already spent scarce reserves fighting the pandemic and providing social protection to millions of affected households. Ghana has been advocating that innovative financing must also address structural challenges beyond responding to immediate fiscal needs by providing mechanisms to facilitate investments in health infrastructure, technology, the environment, and people that would bolster resilience and equitable recovery. The IMF's unprecedented $650 billion United States SDR allocation offers a unique opportunity to provide additional financial resources to address the vast and surging inequities the pandemic has revealed and a crisis to come. Africa's allocation is some 33 billion United States dollars. If ever there was a time for an African Marshall Plan, it is now. The SDR infusion should be seized upon as a catalytic effort to leapfrog Africa to the next level of human development and ensure sustained global prosperity. African leaders have advocated for a prudent and transparent channeling of 25 to 35 percent of SDRs, that is 160 to 230 billion dollars, from wealthier to vulnerable countries, 100 billion dollars of which should be dedicated to Africa. We welcome the support of the European countries represented at the Africa Summit in, in France, the IMF, the G7, and G20 to some SDR redistribution. Mr. President, proceeds of channeled SDRs should fund vaccine acquisition and manufacturing, climate and green investments, and a pan-African stability mechanism like the European Stability Mechanism that will safeguard financial stability on the continent. A part of the redistribution should also help fund the recapitalization of the African Development Bank and Afri Exim Bank to support industrialization, private sector job creation, and the African Free Trade, Continental Free Trade Initiative. Thirdly, we must reposition key multilateral organizations and international financial institutions such as the United Nations, the other Bretton Woods institutions, and the G20 to reflect inclusiveness, support country investments in global public goods, and ensure fast-track financial support to build back better and prepare for future pandemics. For instance, the key to the G20's effectiveness is that it achieves representative coverage of the global population and economy with a diversified enough number of leaders at the table to enable speed and flexibility in deliberation and decision making. Admitting the African Union to an expanded G21 would have the same galvanizing effect within Africa that the EU's participation in the G20 has within Europe strengthening policy coordination and coherence across the 54 African economies. With the African Union at the table, the group suddenly would have representation for 54 more countries, 1.3 billion more people, and 2.3 trillion more output. This extraordinary increase in representation will add just one seat to the table and about 10 minutes to the discussion. However, it will redefine global policy coordination to enable a more prosperous, inclusive, and sustainable world to em emerge. Fourthly, we in Africa are as committed as any to the fight against climate change. We believe, however, that the fight is better advanced 
if we're able to maintain the crucial balance between economic, political, and environmental imperatives, positions that we will be articulating in Glasgow at the COP26 conference, which should form part of the new global compact. Lastly, now more than ever, we must defend democracy, constitutional rule, and human rights in the world. In the last 24 months, we've witnessed assaults on democracy around the world, sometimes even in developed countries where we had assumed that a consensus on the democratic form of governance had been established. Mr. President, in West Africa, recent events in Mali and Guinea have undermined democratic governance in our region. ECOWAS, the regional body whose authority I have the honor to be the current chair, is unreservedly committed to maintaining democratic governance in the ECOWAS community. That is why both Guinea and Mali, foundation members of the community, have been suspended from its organization pending the restoration of democratic governance. We welcome the support of the United Nations for the measures taken. ECOWAS has given Guinea six months to do so and requested the immediate, and requested the immediate release of President Alpha Conde. On my visit to Conakry last Friday, the military leaders indicated their willingness to see to his imminent release, and it is our hope that they will keep to their word. The authority has also made it clear to the military government in Mali that it is not prepared to negotiate an extension to the February deadline for the holding of democratic elections, as the essential steps to be taken can, with political will, be effected within the ECOWAS sanctioned timetable. It is better that a government with a democratic mandate be in place as soon as possible to implement the necessary reforms for the future stability and growth of Mali, thereby enhancing capacity for the all-important fight against terrorism in Mali and in the wider Sahel. We in Ghana highly resolve that we will continue to defend democracy and constitutional rule and uphold human rights. We shall work to strengthen the institutions that support democracy in our country and in our region. We shall continue to support the United Nations and other international organizations to help remind us that indeed, no man is an island.